worldwide. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans. Time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters of Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans keeping out of our science fiction classrooms and jumping to a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun into Clemson. So without uh, further ado, um, you are looking at the screen, you will know this is a fireside chat episode, and we thought we would uh, we talk about um, writing holidays in science fiction. Uh, before we get um, too deep into that, um, can you guys go around and introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers? We'll start with you, A.M. Stevens. Hi, I'm Adam Stevens. All right, and then we've got Matt Oleron. I probably butchered that, but... It's uh, uh, Matt are... Oleron. It's actually a tie name. Yeah, I wasn't even close. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go for next time. Yep. All right, Keith, can you uh, introduce yourself to our uh, our viewers? Hi, I'm Keith Hedger, currently trying not to freeze in Iowa, and I'm the author of the Burn and Karma stories and increasingly the Phoebe the Tank stories. All right. And because you have a story in this one, Nick, you get to introduce yourself this time. Oh, wow. So I, I don't no. get another get thing. <laughs> a little word. World's okay, guy. Uh, I'm Nick Garber, president of AppGG Comics and author of upcoming World Worlders. All right. And then we have Mr. Garrett Michael Brown, the uh, voice of the Sleigh Bells Ring Anthology. Uh, you, you did an amazing job, sir. Can you introduce you yourself? Hi, to our guys. Gary, Michael Brown. Nice to be here. All righty. And then we've got Mr. Steve Diamond. Can you introduce yourself to our audience? Hey, I'm Steve Diamond. Uh, I am an author for Bain uh, and Wordfire Press, primarily horror, but also, you know, science fiction, fantasy. Um, my uh, had a book come out, co authored with my buddy Larry Correa. And that was, uh, that book's called Servants of War. And that came out in March. And uh, yeah, excited to be here with y'all. All right. And then we got Mr. Reggie. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers? Hey, how y'all doing? I'm uh, Reggie. Uh, right now it's uh, 3 a.m. I'm in a uh, Ramstein right now, trying not to, uh, as the other gentleman said, freeze his ass off in this <laughs> weather. So uh, happy yeah, to be here. Miserable. It's not actually. It's my first time in Europe, so I'm having a blast. Nice. Um, better you than me. <laughs> All right, and last but not least, we have Miss HP Hollow. Can Hello. you introduce yourself? Yes, I am HP Hollow, author of the Monster Punk Horizon series, um, which is basically not quite Monster Hunter fan fiction, but si silly monster hunters getting up to ridiculous adventures. Um, and also The Wizard's Way, which is young little steampunk fantasy. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, I write silly fantasy. That's it. <laughs> silly is uh, is good. The world is too serious right now, so I will take it. All righty. And um, so we have the um, anthology was created. There was uh, every year, you know, you got the picture of Santa basically kicking in doors and uh, every year we saw that meme. I said, you know, one of these days I'm gonna I'm gonna host that anthology. Uh, and then when I said that last year, they said, uh, do it and I'll buy. It. Um, and when I had a hundred people say they were gonna buy it, and we sold a hundred copies, I was like, well, okay, let's do this. So, uh, and we have Jamie um, Glover who did this amazing cover art. Uh, that is just. Yeah, I, I have that on my uh, my screensaver now, so it is glorious. So, what uh, what made you guys decide that you wanted to contribute to this anthology? It was a little bit uh, out of the um, the beat off the beaten path, so to speak. So, what made you guys decide? You know what? This sounds like fun. I'm going to submit something. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll start. Um, for me, badass Santas, it's like one of my favorite genres of Santa. 
And if you've read any of my work, you know that I love ridiculous stuff to begin with. And so uh, once the moment I found out about the anthology, I was like, heck yes, this is right up my alley. I did have to get a bit clever with how I actually wrote the story in that respect, um, because there at, at the time there wasn't really a santa figure in my setting so i kind of had to this is the the I, well i wrote it um my contribution the um last great hunt of santa and the candy goose is set inside the monster punk horizon world and um and so there wasn't really a santa figure and so i had to figure out well how how does how would i fit santa into this universe and it was a fun little exercise uh well your story was amazing so you you did well <laughs> So what about you, Reggie? What made you decide, you know what? This sounds fun. I'm going to do this. So uh, this actually goes back probably about a good 15 years ago. Uh, I was uh, right out of high school and me and my friend were talking about uh, ridiculous stories. So he had actually come up with what if Santa was like a crazy murderous killer and his elves like helped him do all this stuff. So that's like been in my mind for 15 years. And then when you said anthology, but Santa's an operator, I kind of already had like a, a baseline for it. So uh, yeah, it wasn't too hard to just kind of tweak it a little bit into like sci-fi uh, to a sci-fi setting, but that's always been there. And um, my friend enjoyed the, uh, he enjoyed it immensely. He was laughing uh, the entire time. That's always a good thing. So, Steve, you were uh, invited specifically because I thought, you know, you write horror. I know if uh, if your your fans Damn are listening, it. I know they got a drink and yeah, that's right. their liver is gonna gonna die. But I thought, you I know, my drink. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, this is a lot of a lot of these stories are gonna be military sci-fi or military fantasy. And I started thinking about it. You know, I'd like to see what horror would look like in this in this theme. So I actually invited you specifically because I wanted to see what a horror story would look like as a Santa as badass operator. So, and <laughs> yeah, you didn't it was, uh, yeah, it, it was it was it was interesting. Um, when when you invited me, I thought I thought, okay, well, this is strange. Santa is an operator. Okay, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> And, and I've been dying to write basically, you know, basically in the alien universe for ages. Uh, <laughs> so this is totally not aliens. Um, I promise. Uh, you know, but, but, you know, Santa and his, and his army of clone elves, um, you know, there, there's no planet too far. No, uh, you know, no aliens too tough to murder in order to, to save one girl on the, on the nice list. So, uh, you know, so I got to write that and it, it was a little strange. Um, every time, every time I'd write and I'd type the word Santa, I kind of have to stop and stare at that word for a little bit and go, is this, is this what I do now? Like do, I write Santa fiction now, well, whatever. <laughs> so, Added it to the list. I know, right? I mean, just one more checkbox for me. It was awesome. I had a great time doing it. So what about you, Garrett? You uh, you came to us and you said, you know, I'd really like to do this, um, this audio book for you guys. So what made you decide that this sounded like something that would be fun and that you just, you wanted to do this? Uh, like somebody, well, first of all, is this, is this working better now, Matt? You can yeah. hear me out of both yeah. ears now? Both ears. Fantastic. I'm the audio guy. You think I should be able to have this down by now? Um, <laughs> so I'm just in a constant mode to uh, to network and try to find new authors to work with. Um, and this seems like a fantastic, fantastic idea. And yeah, like uh, like Ms. Hollow said earlier, um, the 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 cover is fantastic. I just had to see Santa with a flamethrower, and that was like, oh no, I'm I'm in. That's good. I'll I'd love to try something new. My first Christmas stuff, my first Santa stuff, and it might as well be Santa killing things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's wholesome, right? Killing yeah, things, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Nick, Let's you and I, high. when we when we uh, put this together, uh, I was still trying to come up with an idea for the story, 
and uh, you and I were just um, maybe uh, beverages were involved. Uh, yeah, we're just, we were just drunk and chit chat. And we were going back and forth, and we're like, you know, what happens if uh, the the bad was overshadowing the good, and you got to go primal to fix that crap. So yeah. you and I sat and said, well, how would that look? And then we went uh, instead of going sci-fi, we went uh, military fantasy, and uh, and we just had fun. Um, it was probably a little too fun because we were um, we were laughing the whole time as we were writing this, which is always a good thing. It's so, so uh, rage rages. The, that's why we were yeah. laughing. Laugh. It was like, and then this elf jumps across across this table with his automatic cross cross boom 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 boom. boom. He's just savage, and I'm like, I watched watch that out of this. If it was a movie, I'm gonna get hell out of it. And I helped with the right damn thing. Yeah, it was it was definitely a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I know you and I talked about, you know, we might even next year see if we can uh, can tell that story uh, more, you know, expand expand yeah, that yeah. universe because we had so much fun with it. But uh, what about you, Keith? What made you decide? You know what? I'm going to submit to this uh, this crazy wackadoo anthology. Well, you had told me about the anthology and the concept behind it, and I was sitting there probably a month, a couple of months later or a month later. And it was like, well, I've got Phoebe the Tank, who's a fictional character, and they want Santa Claus, who's a fictional character. Now, where can I have those two meet up and do horrible things to somebody who really deserves it? <laughs> and I ended up in West Texas. Oh. <laughs> and off we went. Oof. And I decided human trafficker. It was a Christmas Eve truce, and human traffickers were taking advantage of it and let the tank in on that one. <laughs> So that's uh, kind of yours how it was, got bored. <laughs> yours was definitely um, one of the darker ones, and I loved it. So, oh well, you, uh, I'm hoping <laughs> you, there you was did, just enough well. humor in there to level that out a little bit. Yeah, no, you did. You did good. I, I loved it. So, what about you, Matt? What made you decide that uh, that you wanted to submit something to this one? Well, honestly, uh, this I think goes back to the the first time I heard that Weird Al album with the uh, Bad Hair Day with the song "The Night Santa Went Crazy" on it. The ideas just sort of gelled together from there. Where, uh, <laughs> like, you know, I'm also an army vet out of I don't know how many we have in the group here, but yeah, I figured knowing about free fall and all that, nothing really starts off a story and says operator like Santa doing a halo jump. So that yeah, the idea just sort of flowed out from there. Oh shit. Yeah, that's uh, that's always a fun way to do it. So uh, we we went with the dope on the rope attitude instead of the the halo jump, just because do something a little different. But I, I liked how you did yours. It was definitely uh, it was definitely unique. So, and what about you, Adam? I was bullied into it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm in the same writing group as Matt, and so like the opportunity sprung up. I was like, oh, okay, let's see where we go with this. And it was really a challenge also to myself because. It was so out of genre for me because I mostly write in like sci-fi fantasy. And so being forced to like write in a different genre and also like kind of be in the vein of like uh, holiday characters. And I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for it. And it was like a late night and on TV, Kelly's Heroes came on. I was like, oh, I'll just do that. Nice. And set it in Vietnam. And uh, the rest is history. Absolutely. So... We've talked about why everyone decided to submit. So do you think um, that when you write science fiction and, you know, you, you merge that with the lore that is, you know, the, the Santa and all of that, is there anything you have to have to make it cross that divide um, to make it still be very obviously a Santa story, but also fit the the sci-fi or the fantasy genre well it kind of goes into like how i initially because i used to not touch fantasy at all um and there was a certain divide that i crossed where i was like oh like fantasy is just science that is never explained and so just kind of figuring that out and like implementing that into like the, the santa aspect is like okay here's magical bs that's going on and we're just going to roll with that and also just having, uh, I think the, the crazier part is where that sort of intersects with like real world elements and like balancing all that. It's like, yeah, we're flying, a, we're flying a reindeer over Vietnam and we just got shot by an RPG. Cool. <laughs> oh, Hate it when that happens. 
hate it when that happens. Absolutely. Right. Always annoying. All right. All right. So, uh, Robert W. Ross. So, what made you decide? Well, first, can you introduce yourself? Because you were, we started early. So, uh, I'm yeah, sorry, about, sorry that. about that. Did, did I know that it, we started early? Uh, no, I'm just. Oh, okay. Good. I, I blame I, Nick because he's here. Did I miss something? I was like, did yeah. I miss <laughs> then I was thinking, was there a time zone change that I'm unaware of? Uh, yeah, so uh, Robert W. Ross, I write um, fantasy, sci-fi, and paranormal romance. Um, and uh, I've got uh, three series in market, Sentinels of Creation, Paradigm 2045, and um, One Heart That Beats for Two. All right, and so what made you decide that you wanted to submit to uh, the Santa as Badass Operator Anthology? Because that's not the... Um you know, the most normal themed <laughs> anthology. No, it, it isn't, but it was actually a, a perfect timing and a perfect um, genre because I, I had uh, a short story in mind uh, for, um, for Santa Claus. Um, and it, it was a, uh, a mashup of, uh, if people have read my, my work, there's a, um, it's, uh, it's based on uh, kind of wor world as myth where enough people believe in a thing and it manifests, uh, which a, a kind of a concept that was pioneered by Robert Heinlein. Um, and so um, the mantle of good tidings uh, came, out of the, came out of darkness and became Santa Claus. Uh, and it rests on a human being, just like the mantle of war and the, the mantle of, uh, of revenge and a bunch of others that are in my series. So I thought I was I was noodling on the idea of this mantle of good tidings, um, and it, how it had three aspects, um, which interacted with Charles Dickens uh, in the uh, 19th century and gave rise to his Christmas Carol. Um, and um, the uh, I don't want to give too much away for people to read the story, but but the um, the aspect that we most uh, frequently a tribute to Christmas, the Santa Claus aspect is the only aspect of the three that can be um, can be killed. The um, the first aspect, uh, which from the Christmas Carol you know is the, the ghost of Christmas past, and the third aspect, which is the the dark cloaked one, uh, are both immortal and can't be harmed. Um, but the th but the middle one for that twenty four hours while he's running around on the sleigh giving gifts can be killed. So the main characters from my Sentinels of Creation series are, are going to ride with him in the sleigh, trying to keep him safe um, as he uh, continues uh, his journey and is rather badass in, in and of himself. Um, so, um, so yeah, some, a bunch of demons and other things are trying to off him, um, and they, they got more than they bargained for. Okay. So yours was the one of the ones that was the – your universe almost was already sort of primed for this story. Um, yeah. So were you already thinking of along the lines of stories with, uh, with Santa in your world? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I had already thought of and was concepting the, um, the, the, the mantle uh, uh, that would be Santa Claus. Um, and at the time that, um, that, uh, you, it came across that that Bayonet wanted to do this 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 series, and uh, I was like, "Oh, this is this would be perfect." So um, uh, it, it was really just perfect timing, and and um, I was able to to pound out like fifty thousand word short story really quickly because it just it fit really perfectly, and um, I'm really happy with it because I, I love um, when my characters interact with historic people, like in this case Charles Dickens. Um, and uh, it's that kind of Forrest Gumpian thread that's in a lot of my series where the characters interact historically um, with other um, people of note. Okay. So do you think, and this is sort of open to everyone, do you think when you write um, holiday-themed stories in, you know, that you write in fantasy and or um, sci-fi that you have to have certain themes in order to make it relevant to modern readers? This is a little bit of everybody. 
I know when I did mine, that was part of the challenge for mine because the the setting, the fantasy setting, is a completely different, not universe, but a, a completely different world. And so they didn't naturally have um, in this setting um, the just naturally existing those kinds of cues. And so basically what I did, a lot of the Monster Punk Horizon series is kind of written by the seat of my pants in terms of the creative elements that come in. And so what I did is just made a list of holiday elements and visuals and whatnot that were relevant um, to modern practices of Christmas and whatnot. And actually in the Monster Punk Horizon story, the holiday is slightly different. Um, in a novel that I had written before I wrote this story, um, there was reference paid to a holiday called Holomas, which is basically a combination Halloween and Christmas. And um, I, I primarily did that just because those are my two favorite holidays and Halloween and Christmas season it just kind of becomes one big season to me. <laughs> and, and so I was basically like, okay, Halloween has candy and costumes and all sorts of craziness. And Christmas also has some food themes. And also I need to figure out what kind of monster I'm going to use in this story, because obviously you can't have a, a, a monster hunting story without an iconic monster. And I kept landing on the idea of the goose because you, you don't really see it so much in modern um, Christmas fiction, but in Victorian Christmas stories, you know, they were always going for the holiday goose. And the thing about geese is I absolutely hate them. <laughs> I, when I have, I have goose trauma. Like, okay, so I have a story. I was, when I was in college, I, I was in art school briefly and the art building was kind of offset from the rest of the campus. And it was in this really, really nice sort of slightly forested area with this really nice stream and a lot of open space. And it was really nice to go draw, but then the geese came and this enormous flock of geese would would come and settle on all of the um just all the, the field and near the stream and in order to get to all my other classes i had to go through this gauntlet of geese and so i'd basically pull up my portfolio and and my other backpack and just kind of build a little shield and then just run and the geese would come after me and it was terrifying and so i just i don't mess with geese and so I knew I knew there was going to be a giant goose as the monster, and I figured, you know, why not? Let's do let's do a giant goose made of candy. And what's the conflict going to be? Because there needs to be a reason for Santa to come to for, for Santa to be hunting this goose. Um, let's just have the goose eat his family. It's <laughs> and he's hunting the goose yeah. to avenge his family. And then I just spun yeah. this. So the, the and so I just started getting more and more ridiculous with it. And so in in the setting, Santa for this story becomes a legendary figure, and it's uh, it, it's the sort of thing where they look forward to sighting Santa because it means the candy goose is nearby, and they get to help Santa hunt the candy goose. And it's it's like a real holiday thing that everyone is really pumped for on this entire continent of monster hunters. Um, but yeah, so it was I, I basically all of that just started from a little list. <laughs> <laughs> okay what about you reggie what uh what do you think you have to to bring with you in order to make this uh sort of iconic and you know holiday you, how do you how do you bring that in into a fantasy or sci-fi setting well uh, mine didn't really have too much to do with holidays but i had to bring the elves in and i had to bring the uh reindeer in and I really wanted it to be like really over the top and kind of absurd. So, um, you know, I had the reindeer flying into the uh, uh, into the uh, to the helicopter. Uh, I had Sa Santa with the reindeer gauntlets, uh, you know, stabbing and decapitating soldiers. So there was no holiday in it. Like in my story, there's no reference to the month or the weather or anything like that i just wanted to get straight to the action straight to the killing to the guns and uh to the senseless murder and santa trying to protect the only free nation in the entire world so in a way i wonder if that is somewhat of a holiday theme right because isn't that what the spirit of christmas is exactly it's just like die hard Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's diehard. Killing and violence and protecting people. And it is the Christmas. greatest Christmas movie ever ever filmed. My daughter continues to say it's not, but she's wrong. 
<laughs> clearly, clearly she's wrong. <laughs> Die Hard is a Christmas movie. It yeah, is Cindy Sider. Yeah. So is Lethal Weapon. I was about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So what? So what about you, Stephen? What do you think um, a story has to have if you want to to write um, a a fantasy or sci-fi sort of trope for um, for a holiday theme? How do you, how do you translate what we understand as Earth, the the holiday as we understand it, and still make it fit in the fantasy or sci-fi? Uh, for me, it's it's always about giving giving the reader something familiar. Uh, in, in my case, it was I mean, <laughs> it's somewhat easy in that it's Santa, right? You're just like, this is Santa, he he exists, and then you know, and then he has elves and they exist. Um, I anchored it on that, and then on the the concept of the naughty and the nice list. Um, it, it sounds like most of us kind of picked one aspect that really that really kind of hit us and 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 kind of you know splintered off from there for me that's what it was i mean within the first i think couple sentences of the story you know i introduced the idea that you know that a bunch of people that were on both the nice and the naughty lists both just vanished within the span of of a couple seconds <laughs> uh and and so so santa's like well i mean which list were they on if they're on the naughty list, then it's like, well, that's that's tragic. Oh no. <laughs> anyway, but uh, oh. but as soon as he hears that that there's one person on the nice list, then he then he you know Santa has to operate at that point. Um, and so I think I think all it is is giving them something familiar, uh, giving the reader something just just one little anchor. It's a short story; mm-hmm. it doesn't need to be a lot. And so one small anchor is is all that it takes for. For the readers to really connect, I mean, look, they're they're picking up a they're picking up an anthology where the cover is is Santa with a flamethrower and a bazooka over his shoulder, right? Like, it's amazing. like they, they don't they're they're not in this for like, um, for like the Hallmark movie channel, right? They're in this because they want to see Santa kill some crap. Um, yeah. and so so for me, I was like, well, Santa's going to LV four two six. Only they can't call it that anymore because of legal reasons. <laughs> So, you know, that's where he goes and he, he, they find another indigenous species of aliens there and they kill the crap out of it all to save one girl. And I, and I think that in the spirit of Christmas holiday cheer, yes. um, you know, that it just, it just warms the heart, doesn't it? Just, it just knowing all that under the cockles. that's right. Santa shooting aliens in the face <laughs> to save Christmas like that. That's what brings joy to people's to, to children's hearts Warm these days. The, the, the girl, the girl has to be rewarded for being nice all year. That's right, and she is. I mean, it, it, it would be for nothing if, uh, if he didn't and, do that. Having I just love seeing Santa's bodies. <laughs> so you have a unique um, approach to these stories, Garrett, because you didn't tell the story with the words, but you used, you know, the inflection of your voice and sort of uh, acted essentially these stories out. So how do you go about bringing about that holiday cheer without, um, you know, with while maintaining the holiday spirit without, you know, going a little bit too, too far in the wacky realm? That that's a great question. And uh, that is, Honestly, entirely up to you guys. Um, how you write the story is how I think I can bring it across. Um, there was nothing too far out there that was too, in my opinion, too much. Um, and there was there was humor. The big thing is there was humor and self, not deprecation, but, you know, self-referential in every single one of these stories. It was, yeah, there was definitely some sci-fi. There was definitely some horror. There was definitely some scary stuff. But it, everything had a little just drop of humor in there every now and then. It kept it grounded. So it made it easier to stay on Santa being your anchor for the whole thing. And he generally had the same voice, depending on the story. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, but it, it was really it's on you guys. Like it, I have the easy job. I have the easy, fun job. I could not in a million years do what any of you guys do. Um, so that's that's my long answers to say. I don't know. I, I think that goes both ways. And I, I do um, alpha reads to the the sadists 
that uh, tell me all the chapters of my books that are complete shit and need to be rewritten. Um, <laughs> when I do them, one of their comments is that, thank God you're not a narrator because part of the reasons this chapter is so bad is because you're reading it. Um, so uh, I, I, have, <laughs> I have a lot of, a lot of respect Rough. for that, for that, uh, for that skill set. My, my, uh, my series are narrated by um, somebody, uh, by a guy named Nick Podell. And when uh -huh. he, um, it just amazes me when you guys can, can switch from one character to the other uh, and maintain the continuity and then remember uh, two chapters later when a, a character comes back in what they sound like. I can't, I just, it's just, my, my brain just doesn't work that way. So it's really, it's, it's fantastic uh, a collaboration between the skills, I think. Thanks. I think so too. I've often found that with, with my stuff, my preferred version of my stuff that has been adapted into audio is actually the audio version versus the print version because the narrators handle it so well. Yeah, I agree. Well, good. I'm, glad, I'm glad it's working out for you. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's, that makes, uh, it makes our life possible. So speaking of making our life possible, we're going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly shill for the man. Ho, ho, oh, hell. Is that sleigh bells ringing in your ears or a few rounds from an M60? You wanted the jolly fat man to bring Yuletide joy, but the season has gifted you with a heartbreaker and a life taker. Badass Santa. Grab your eggnog and camouflage candy canes. Strap on your bulletproof holiday stockings and prepare for thrills and kills. From bloodstained rebellion at the North Pole to a black ops raid on a distant planet, these 18 action-packed tales will show you Saint Nick as you have never seen him before. It's all you'll want for Christmas. That ad was fire. Thank you. That very was much. Uh, oh, yeah, that I was love that well ad. done. That was pretty pretty cool. Thank so, you. That was right. so fun. So so that Nick, was the first um, commercial I've ever made. It was so fun. Yeah, you did good. You did good. So Nick, what do you think you have to do when you want to write a you know holiday themed story in um, sci fi or fantasy? Like, how do you do you think you balance the um, the need to have the tropes of of the holiday without um losing some of what makes sci-fi and fantasy so much fun uh that's a really good question um i wish i had i had a really good aim for it but i'm, I'm just gonna wait um well you gotta kind of fall within the limitations of lore and the thing about santa is that there's a lot of lore out there on it on it so you take what you can keep Thing have to be in there like he has to be of a certain size he maybe give the ho ho ho, ho. he's got like changed throughout the, the ages or whatever um the elves, elves are kind of key to the story um, um you know you, you you play with what you can you kind of kind of bend those rules without breaking you don't want the fans mess mad at you like there's there's people that are really into christmas i am one of them but i, I do enjoy operator Raider santa store so so um, yeah, it's it really is a balance that I that I wish I could tell you what it was. It's, it's different for every writer; they all have their own their own um, press on how, how they do things. And, and you know, I really wanted wanted to make like a grounded kind of Santa, Santa that this operator just just came up with his, his hey man, I gotta gotta start stacking bodies to even this this stuff out, you know. And then the elves were really really into it, and it was funny funny through the story to start going to. Uh, I turn the cam camera off. Let's try that. That nobody wants to see my face in this anyway. Um. All right. So, what about you, Keith? So, how do you balance the need to have the sort of iconic tropes that are the holiday themes while still writing fantasy and or uh, sci-fi? Yeah. Yeah. Um, mine was based on 
kind of really loosely on some of my experiences in the army where Christmas comes around and no one cares because you're deployed or you're about to deploy or you got stuck on CQ Facts. or there's some stuff you something needs done and you're there. So that's kind Facts. of where I tied that in. But there's anywhere you're at, even in the military, Christmas comes up, the holidays come up. There's stuff that happens around you. You know, you're going to get a better meal at the dining facility. This, that, the other things going on. Yeah, whatever that whatever that situation was. And the aspect of Santa Claus that I really kind of tied into this story was mostly he gives gifts to the people who or to the people, I guess, on to borrow uh, Steve's line, the people in the nice list for values of nice. They're getting something they need. In Phoebe's case, she needs an independent to in, act independently. And. uh Wilser, Wilser's place, Jess Wilser's place, she needs a combat lead role. And in the human traffickers case, well, they're getting coal and or whatever munitions Santa Claus brought along. <laughs> so I kind of focused on the gift giving piece of kind of what Santa is. And then twisted it to military sci-fi ish and rolled with it. Okay. What about you, Matt? Matt. All right. Uh, Adam, what about you? What do you think um, is like, how do you think you balance the need to have some of the um, iconic holiday tropes and still also fit the sci-fi or fantasy? Check, check. Oh, welcome back, Matt. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, well, the biggest thing that I was like kind of focusing in on was like the whole charity bit because the whole story kicks off with him getting this Christmas letter about a kid who wants his dad to be home from the Vietnam War for Christmas. I was like, yeah, that's that's a good starting basis. We'll run with that. And kind of having that like sort of bittersweet holiday ending where like there's the family reunion and Santa just rides off into the sunset. So that was really like like the central like kind of like aspect I took from like a lot of the Christmas lore and like how a lot of holiday movies run to like get that story in. Okay. What about you, Matt? Can you, uh, can you hear us now? Yeah. Um, I, so long as you guys can hear me, right? Yep. We're good. Okay. Yeah. So what I, uh, went in on was the fact that a lot of the time, the end of the year stuff, Santa, especially in kind of a tropey way is all about hope. So there's always gotta be that kind of kernel just sitting somewhere in the story. But I also played with the idea of what we're seeing these days with like holiday creep where like, oh, all of October is now Halloween. All of December is now uh, Christmas, so on and so forth. And so it just came to me as the idea of like, well, some people are really annoyed with that. I see a lot of like very public posting of like, well, November is also like not supposed to be Santa's ho uh, month as well. So it rolled into like, oh, well, what if, you know, the holidays from further along down the year have to get rid of the other holidays to make sure that the world keeps on working. Okay. That's uh that sounds a lot like what, uh, what HP hollow wrote with hers. So there was some, there was some overlap. So does, um, does everyone think that they might potentially tell more uh, stories with these characters or was this a one and done and you're, you're happy to move on? I definitely have I had about, me. uh, a couple of people say that they were uh, interested and wanted to see where the story went. So, yeah, maybe. Okay. I'm, I'm definitely going to be writing some more, at least about Phoebe and probably about Wilser. I could see Santa Claus making another appearance in one of my settings, too. So. Okay. And if people want it, if people, if someone wants more of a certain story from me, I mean, I'm not going to say no. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm all for getting down and murdering the crap out of monsters and stuff. I mean, who doesn't yeah, like hey. that? Yeah. On that note, I'm definitely writing more with mine and, and the way my story ends, there's actually some interesting stuff I could potentially do with the Santa in the future. So there is that. Okay. Um, what about you, uh, Adam or, uh, or Matt, you guys think well, you're going to, uh, you're going to continue? I think I'm definitely going to bring him back for Afghanistan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've got a line in there, something about him teaming up with Oliver North to save Christmas. So there's definitely some room to uh, open that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Wow. Okay. The um, so are you you uh, you think you're going to go with the Iran Contra stuff, or are you just going to go the uh, you know his his iconic sort of uh, military TV shows that he does? Uh, something probably before the Iran Contra thing, you know, because Ali was in the army for a while too. So there was there's some room to play around with it. It's just uh, it was just kind of an interesting like joke that we had uh, been saying while I was like writing the first draft and just got stuck around all the way to the end. So actually now I have to go back and figure it out. I was also tossing around some ideas about something that happens earlier in the year, you know, uh, teams up with uh, St. Patrick or anybody really, just because it's all about uh, getting rid of the rest of the holidays. Okay. That would be interesting. So what, um, wow. Okay. So that one, that one sounds interesting. Um, the, the Ollie North thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so what about the rest of you? Do you think you might, you might tell the, the stories with, uh, with your characters and keep it, keep it going? Or are you, you pretty content with, uh, with the way you wrapped it up? Well, mine, I, I, um, it actually spawned the idea when I was told some of my patrons about it. Um, they all started telling me about other stories that they wanted to hear about. Um, uh, that took place somewhere in between the seven years that the, my main series takes place. So it's a seven books across seven linear years. Um, and it ended um, earlier this year at the final book of the series. <clears throat> and a lot of these folks didn't want to say goodbye to these characters, which I totally get. Um, sure but um, in the same token, I think that if you don't end a series, you're kind of an asshole. Um, so... <laughs> Um, because eventually something will happen, you know, whether it's really good, like you get a movie deal and then you become rich and you don't finish your book, which is not cool. Uh, you can insert a couple people um, in that. Um, or you drop dead, which isn't good either. Um, so I think you need to end the series. But um, uh, kind of the compromise was uh, I'm going to release a, a compendium of short stories that take place in and around those seven years and then a couple of them that take place um you know even a decade after the series ends um one of which you know this would fit into right so um so being able to to take those short stories with characters that are established in the universe uh i think is is a lot of fun uh for and some some really nice fan service if you will uh because people become attached to those characters and it's a way of both completing a, a, the major arc of a series and having that that uh, closure while still allowing folks to revisit those characters in a new and fresh way. It helps if I unmute myself, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, that uh, that definitely sounds um, sounds like you have you have a sort of a plan where you could take it forward. I know Nick and I uh, when we wrote our story, we we very much. Um, kept the ability to keep the story going. Um, it, it was definitely something we planned from the beginning that, um, you know, if, if it was popular enough that potentially we do another Santa anthology, then we could, you know, bring those characters back. Um, so I definitely, I definitely think, you know, I've never seen a short story where I couldn't come up with an idea for a series around it. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, absolutely. So do you think um, that the, the, the holiday theme that, uh, that we all sort of wrote into the story, um, do you think that, you know, those kinds of stories are timeless or do you think um, those are the kinds of stories that would potentially um, age out where, you know, in a couple of years, maybe they're not as relevant to, to the readers? I think it depends upon the individual story, to be honest. I mean, obviously, like stories that that pay reference to like immediate current events are probably going to to be a little a, a little less relevant, say, 50, 100 years from now. But I think regardless of current events or those elements, I think certain holiday themes are very timeless and uh, and in effect make the stories timeless. Yeah, I think. 
I, you know, the, the concepts of hope or the, you know, that, that, that some of y'all were talking about, or, you know, the ideas of the naughty and nice lists, those, those things have, those things have been involved with the whole, with, with Santa for, for years upon years upon years. And I find it hard to believe that they would just suddenly vanish overnight. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, there are certain things that are fairly new in, in culture, so to speak. And, you know, I just keep thinking of that atrocity of the elf on the shelf. And, I, and, <laughs> and of course now, of course now I'm thinking, you know, maybe, you know, may, maybe that's what my next story would be about Santa going house to house, you know, uh, oh, country elf. to country, just murdering the elf on the shelf over and over again. Just to save Christmas for every for every parent out there. <laughs> well, but, I mean, uh, the, the crazy trivia is the Elf on the Shelf actually sprang into being as a marketing campaign in the early two thousands. It's literally just out of nowhere. It's horrible. It is and, horrible. But you know, so I think I think like like HP said, if 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 we're going off of current events, regardless of whether we're talking about like a Santa story or talking, you know, you know, broader. Anytime you put very firm like time anchors into a story, um, especially if they're current, things can get dated. It's like when you read any detective fiction from the from the eighties and early nineties, and they 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 refer to like um, uh, to like to like phone booths and stuff and, and shoving coins into a phone, like that that stuff. It just doesn't resonate anymore for unless you're over a certain age. And so, but but if you use general concepts. Um, general holiday concepts, hope and charity, and and then you know, bigger things, you know, or, or, or more detailed things in the, in the sense of you know, naughty and nice lists, elves and building toys and stuff like that. Like that stuff will stick around for a long time, I think, and, and it'll impart some sort of of ageless quality to it. Now that said, if your story sucks, it doesn't matter what you do. Like right. your story, no one cares, no one cares, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, if your story's good. And you're and you're imparting really interesting ideas into it, then then it'll last no matter what. But you know that's why I think some of y'all that, that that did stuff in the past that's easier. I mean not easier, but I mean it, it'll it'll keep your story relevant for longer. I think, and that's why mine is set in like the year like twenty four fifty one or something. Like like none of us are going to be alive to see that, so so no one cares. Yeah, at a certain point, things go from being dated to being retro, and suddenly it's cool again. <laughs> exactly, and so you know, y'all sent the stories in, you know, in Vietnam or whatever. Like, like that's awesome, and and that 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 gives really good qualities to story that I think help it surpass the 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 dangers of being dated by by years or by references and stuff. Hmm. Weirdly, at least in the timeline of where this story falls for mine, it is it it will be dated within my own setting, but that's okay because I figured out the other day a way to make a space marine novel I wrote kind of tied to Phoebe, and that means Phoebe and Santa Claus may have a much millennia long relationship that I haven't figured out yet. <laughs> but yeah. Then I can turn around and write a story where Santa goes and visits bad karma next, next, just for fun of it, and see how that goes. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have been trying to keep our podcast uh, this year um, to keep it closer to an hour. So uh, with so many people here, um, Bless we you are. <laughs> uh, we're going to try and let, and we're going to start with Adam. Uh, let you guys tell the listeners where they can find you. Um, and so that way they can, they can check your other works out. Uh, I don't currently have a whole lot published, uh, but I do have an Instagram account, uh, where I talk about some of my stories and typewriters that I repair. It's called guns and typewriters. Um, and you can find me there. Sure. Okay. And what about you, Matt? Uh, well, first I have to correct myself because I looked it up. Ollie North was in the Marine Corps and I need to do that before some kind of devil dog crawls down my throat later. Yep. Um, <laughs> rah. Uh, that said, I actually do not have anything else currently uh, published. I'm, uh, you know, uh, submission to agents and stuff. I got on a traditional publishing path with some of my other novels. Uh, and yeah, so this is it for now. Okay. What about Although, you, Keith? Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, although Adam and I uh, do are in the same writing group, and we do plan on uh, publishing a few things uh, in other media in coming months. Sweet. Okay, you'll have to uh, come back and tell us about it once you get that uh, that out there. Um, what about you, Keith? Where can uh, listeners and viewers find you? Easiest place is to find me at keithedger.com. <laughs> okay, and nice. you, Nick. That makes it easy. And we're going to link all of that, obviously, to the show notes. What about you, Nick? How can uh, listeners find you? All right, Nick, you're muted. So, All right. So, Garrett, while we wait for Nick to unmute himself, how can uh, listeners and viewers find your uh, find you online? Uh, just type me in on Amazon or Audible. I've got about 40-something books on there, mostly with uh, Athon uh, productions or Athon Publishing and Athon Audio, uh, some with Hachette and Audible Originals and a few other few other things, uh, and then some independent authors uh, I work with as well, uh, and it's working real well. So, just search me Garrett Michael Brown on uh, Audible or Amazon, and I'll be there. All right, and uh, Nick Garber is um, having some internet issues, so we will link his uh, his contact information in the show notes. And uh, with that being said, Steve, how can listeners find you on the wild, wild interwebs? So, uh, it, as my uh, as my website continually uh, struggles to get built, um, the uh, the best place to find me is on is on the Facebooks and the Twitters. Although, if you really if you really need to get a hold of me for something. Um, Probably the easiest place is, is through uh, the Writer Dojo, which is the writing advice podcast that I host with Larry Correa. Um, so you can always, we have a Facebook group on there for, for new and aspiring authors and for veteran authors who, uh, who you know, have advice to give or who, who just, want, just want to run things by, by a group of hungry people. So that's uh, the Writer Dojo. And so you can, you can find me there anytime you need. All right. What about you, Reggie? How can listeners and viewers find you? Uh, you could find me uh, if you if you want to venture to the hellscape of Twitter. Uh, that would be a <laughs> fist of fiction. Uh, it's a fist like your fist of fiction. Uh, that's why I'm on there. Um, I have a book. Uh, it's called The Guardian of the Ward. So if you're interested in teddy bears defending sleeping children from monsters, you can go check that out. It's on Amazon. And um I just finished the prequel to book one, and right now I'm writing a series of uh, military stories um, that uh, kind of took place throughout my career that people are finding very interesting. So be on the lookout for that, but uh, I appreciate the opportunity a lot. <laughs> okay, and what about you, Miss H.P. Hollow? How can listeners and viewers find you? Art, the easiest place is to find me on Amazon, but you can also go to my website, which is hollowwriting.com, and you'll find all of my books and blog and whatnot there. And last but not least, we have Mr. Robert W. Ross. So how can listeners find you on the Wild Wild Interwebs? Um, Ross Author on most of the social channels, so Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, those. Uh, my publisher site is Spartamac, S-P-A-R-T-A-M-A-C.com. Uh, and obviously, uh, Amazon and Audible, if you just do a search for me, then um, my author page will list all the different books. Uh, I think there's like 13 or 14 uh, that are that are available, all available print, ebook, and audio. All right. And you can find us on our Twitter at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email the show at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. You can join us on Facebook where all the shenanigans happen at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. We have our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. Again, anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades, where you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month you can help keep the light on or you can support the show more directly at buymeacoffee.com 
backslash author J.R. Handley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Handley. Uh, and I promise that if you put for the um, – you put in the comment section that is for the podcast – that uh, I will keep my co-host, Doc Seska, and Nick Garber duly caffeinated. They will drink until their liver explodes because, you know, <laughs> that's what you do with caffeine. But uh, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Henley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. So I appreciate all of you guys coming over, and uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. You too, JR. Merry Christmas. <laughs>